This episode is brought to you by Upsonder, the easiest way to monetize your drone. With the industry's only million dollar protection coverage free to its members, Upsonder is the top choice among certified drone pilots to get up and stay up. To get started, create your free listing today at upsonder.com. Welcome to commercialdrones.fm, the podcast that explores the commercial drone industry, the people who power it, and the concepts that drive it. I'm your host, Ian Smith. Hey everyone, welcome to Commercial Drones FM. Today I'm sitting with Colin Snow, the drone analyst, who's the CEO and founder of Skylogic Research. We are at the UAV, Commercial UAV Expo in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, Colin is one of my most anticipated guests whenever I was starting the podcast, so he always has great insights, so really happy to welcome him to the show. Welcome to the show, Colin. Yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's my pleasure, completely. So let's start off, like, uh, who is Colin Snow? Who are you? What's your bio? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, uh, so again, thank you for having me on the podcast. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, official title, like you said, is CEO and founder of Skylogic Research. That's a company I started under the brand Drone Analyst, and that was back in 2012. Uh, my, my work career started really in manufacturing. I was a manager for many years at Olympus Corporation, so that's the camera company. But uh, I worked in the medical uh, device division. And I participated firsthand as that industry moved from optomechanical devices with film cameras that you had to physically attach to and, and vi to video devices that relied on CCD chips. So when CCD chips were first coming out, they were used in industry, and, and medical imaging was one of the first places it was used. Hmm. Um, later, as an industry research analyst in Silicon Valley, I focused on enterprise software, and I uh, looked at the vendors and systems because I worked for those firms. So I worked for Oracle, PeopleSoft, and then most recently, I worked as a mobility products marketing manager for the enterprise cloud software company, SAP, which is a very large worldwide company. Indeed. But I started Drone Analyst in 2012 with the aim of doing research on commercial drones and educating startups and investors with industry trends and uh, regulatory trends, mainly because nobody else was doing it. And uh, everything I was reading up to uh, that point was suspiciously pretty hyped. So I, I named the firm Drone Analyst um, so that people could find me. And it, it was really about getting search engine optimization. Mm. And the business has expanded a lot since then. Um, and I, uh, such that I do now have a staff of advisor contributors. And, um, but today, Skylogic Research, it's a, it's a research content and advisory services form, uh, firm, and it supports all the participants in the commercial uh, unmanned aircraft systems industry. And our goal is to help that community make investment decisions with confidence mm. by providing research-based insights on the commercial drone markets. That's my elevator pitch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> besides that, I write a, a bi-weekly column of quick take analysis on dronelife.com. And I also contribute to the SUAS news under the column, The Market. Okay. Oh, cool. SUAS News. Nice. Yeah. Two of my uh, go-to drone blogs online. Very cool. So why drones for you? I mean, it sounds like from what you said, there's like this like perfect storm that you had, like imaging experience. Drones all most of dro most drones have cameras on them right mm -hmm, now, which right. is very important. And then all this enterprise SaaS software experience and analysis stuff. So why did you choose drones? I mean, was there a specific reason that you chose these or? Yeah, I actually started as a hobbyist, right? And my history of flying uh, drones back then, it was model aircraft, uh, goes all the way back to the 70s when I was high, in high school. And uh, I built a radio controlled model aircraft with my father. My father was an MIT engineer grad mm. and uh, his hobby was building, um, building aircraft. So I learned aviation and aircraft from that. After college though, my, I took a strong interest in photography, and I kind of did not do any more radio-controlled model aircraft flying, but I took a strong interest in photography, and I did aerial photography from Cessnas and the NOAA Hurricane Hunters uh, aircraft in Miami. And as a photographer, I've been an amateur underwater photographer and videographer for years, and I, back in the 80s and 90s, I had a commercial business for a while. 
But it was in the advent of hobby quadcopters back in 2009 that I got back into RC flying. And I started to do what many hobbyists were doing at that point, which was building kits. And back then you had to program flight controllers. And then everyone was attaching GoPro cameras to capture aerial video. And so I did this, right? I, I built these kits. and Just for fun at the time. Just for fun yeah. and, and started flying them. And I, you know, I made a video and the video was you know, somewhat stable um, because at first they weren't. <laughs> um, and I and I got hooked um, because it was so much like uh, underwater photography because you're you're filming in 3D space. So that's that's why mm. I got interested in drones. Huh, that's really cool. So there's a bit of aviation background as well and and model aircraft stuff. So yeah, completely perfect storm to create the drone analyst. That's right. awesome. So uh, you you have um, let's see team members on your team you mentioned um and you're kind of uh, working with a team now did you, you started off just as yourself i guess yeah actually i started off with my wife who uh co-managed co the business together oh, okay um but we're kind of very fortunate to have four independent contributor advisors and we're expanding that but the four that are, we have now are chad colby and jonathan ruprecht and bill mcneil and steve Mahler. Um, besides them, we have a dozen or so contractors to help us do writing and editing and research, and they do the general work. But I'm the chief analyst, I'm the main writer, I'm the project manager, but it's my wife, Charlotte, who is the chief content officer. And she's got more than 20 years of experience in publishing and business management, and market research and <laughs> content marketing, uh, and her background is in tech. Uh, for example, she served as vice president of InfoWorld's test center, and she founded InfoWorld Consulting Services. And um, she's also held uh, executive editorial positions at publications, including Computer World and PC Resource and PC Magazine and PC Work and 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 Computer Shopper. So she's the co-manager. She's the chief content officer. She's my main editor and um, uh, a, a big part of the business. Cool. Uh, the, well, our, I'll go through our contributor advisors and, and talk about them. And one of them is Chad Colby. He's uh, the founder and principal of Colby Ad Tech. And uh, he's here at this conference at uh, the Commercial UAV Expo. And he's considered uh, the leading industry advocate for the use of UAS in, in agriculture. And Chad's also a general manager of a central Illinois ag fifth generation case IH dealership. So he knows a lot about ag. Big old tractors. Big tractors, right? And he he um, uh, he shares his knowledge and his passion of agriculture. And, and he's pretty much an evangelist for drones and agriculture and um um, you can find him at, uh, I think, at the Chad Colby on Twitter. I do want to touch on, just to interject real quick, we will touch on agriculture a, li a little bit later. Okay. Cool. Good, good. Steve Mahler um, is a good friend of mine. He's a founder of Mahler Media, and he's worked in the photo and video software uh, companies uh, as a developer for Apple and Microsoft. He's a professional photographer. He shoots for many Silicon Valley companies like Facebook and Yahoo and Twitter. And he's got a host of others. Steve's like me. It was his photography experience and, and love of flight that drove him to build, you know, increasingly complex and capable aerial camera platforms. And um, he's gained significant expertise in the film, photo, and video commercial drone market. Um, and yeah, let's see, you can find him uh, uh, on Twitter and at Facebook, I think, at Perspective Air. Mm. Uh, Bill McNeil, he's uh, also one of our contributor advisors. He writes for Directions Magazines, and he's really experienced. He's got 25 years of developing and marketing GIS applications. Mm. That's Global Information Systems. That's what GIS stands for. Um, in the early 90s, he founded Krona Software. That's a company that developed GIS applications for sales and automation and CRM. And then Chroma, Krona, I'm sorry, Krona. C H R O N A. That was sold to Esri in 1994, and Bill then worked for Esri, uh, and he managed their business map group for 14 years. Hmm. He's also an avid UAV, uh, UAV pilot, and he's he's our expert in in mapping and surveying. So it, the thing I, things I think you're seeing a pattern here is that what I've got is contributor advisors or experts in the in the individual verticals and applications yes. because nobody can know everything. So I depend on these guys to to advise us and help us and. And, and make contributions. And nice. then uh, rounding out our team right now is Jonathan Ruprecht. Um, and again, these aren't employees, these are just contributors. They all have their independent businesses. Uh, Jonathan Ruprecht should be known by many of your listeners. He's um, he's a drone lawyer and he's a commercial pilot. And he's an air, airplane flight instructor. 
Uh, he's a flight instrument instructor. And, and early on, uh, when the industry was forming, Jonathan authored a book called uh, Drones, Their Many Civilian Uses and uh, the UAS Laws Surrounding Them. And later, he was an advisor for one of the amicus briefs uh, for, the, for the Huerta versus Perker case. Hmm. Um, and he co-authored, he's co-authored, you know, legal treaties on unmanned aircraft and that's published by the American Bar Association. John, Jonathan's uh, currently practicing drone law. He's in South Florida and his firm is Ruprecht Law and you can find him on Twitter, I believe, at at Ruprecht Law. So that's that's nice. my contributor advisors and uh, the people that I've got right now. And like I said, I'm, I'm expanding that. So how do you guys work together? I mean, if, if you're producing a report or some type of analysis uh, documentation, then you'll kind of, you know, contact each one of them and just like, you know, make sure that, hey, like, what do you, what do you think on this, et cetera? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Somebody if somebody contracts with us for, say, for a, for a research report or a piece of content and it's about a specific vertical, so say agriculture or something, then I go to Chad and and we either work together or he reviews the work to make sure it's it's in line with what he sees currently as practices. Um, you know, if, if there's a legal issue, it's Jonathan, if it's mapping and surveying, then it's Bill McNeil. And, you know, if I'm, you know, if I'm writing up a report on, on the latest, uh, you know, photo drone, you know, camera drone, um, then I go to Steve and, and, um, that's how we work together. Nice. Okay, cool. So pr- very well-rounded. Um, so that's really nice to hear. I, you know, I wasn't sure if it was just, you know, just you. I'm actually very, very glad to know that Charlotte, whom I didn't know uh, before, is is behind a lot of the drone analyst uh, content and everything too. So that's great to learn. Um, that's really nice. So moving along now, a little bit more meat here. So uh, this is this is a weird question, but what's your favorite drone right now? Do you have a favorite drone? And I know that's very hard to answer because you need a little bit more. Probably a little bit more um, goading into actually, like you know, for what type of purpose would it be? Et yeah, cetera. yeah, sure. Well, I, you know, I personally fly, so um, and and I've built and owned several over many years. Uh, so, um, but right now I own uh, a Phantom Four, and and um, uh, my favorite is the DJI Inspire One. Um, and I love it for its camera modularity. But again, I'm just doing you know ho- hobby uh, video and photography. So. Um, but I do my own post-production. So uh, mm. being able to film in RAW is important to me and having, you know, good lenses and, you know, enough megapixels in the camera to be able yeah. to produce a resolution. That's all important to me. And I, I keep up with what people are doing, um, you know, professionally and, and kind of prosumer-wise. Mm. Um, but for me, it's about, you know, having fun doing it. But it's also then about learning the user experience. What are people struggling with? What are they learning? So... On the, uh, for example, like on the Inspire, I started with the X3 camera. That was the one that came out with it in version one. But, Mm -hmm. you know, they later come out with an X5 camera, um, uh, which is a micro four thirds camera. And um, I looked at it and I waited. I'm not a first buyer. I'm I'm a guy who waits and sees what happens in the market with something before I go out and spend. Mavic Pro. Yeah, I'm waiting on that one. (laughs) I'm waiting for version 1.1 or 2.0. You know, so I, I... then upgraded to the X5 and, um, you know, looked at the lenses. So I'm very careful about what I buy and look at, you know, what do I think is the right lens. So I got a 12 millimeter mm. Olympus lens and that's sort of, that's my go-to drone. So cool. for, for filming, so that's my, that's my favorite one, but actually I have, um, some experience, uh, trying out drone deploy, oh, uh, cool. with my Phantom four. And, um, nice. you know, it's, it's a great ship for that because it's got an endurance, you know, it's got some endurance in the flight and, you know, the SDKs allowed you to just you know, use the drone deploy app and it uploads and you create a map and it's, it's, it's quite fun. Cool. Cool. So w- going back to like the video stuff. So you said you edit your own stuff. Mm-hmm. What, do you use like Adobe suite of software yep. for I, that? Okay. I do. I use the Adobe creative suite. So, um, premiere pro and I'm self-taught. Um, you yeah. know, I, I just go online and there's so much information. Oh my out there. God. You go to there's YouTube a, videos and you can look out for tutorials for all the little things. And, yeah. and you know, it does take time to learn. I mean, you know, I'm just learning, you know, about LUTs, right. Which is you got to do color correction. People are, people uh. are creating color corrections for S log. Um, that's a raw image file. Uh, capture yeah. capability, um, you know, code. So then you need to add back the color and add back the light. And people are creating LUTs, what are called LUTs, and you huh. import them into Premiere, and then you you color grade your your uh, your images and that type of thing. So nice. Uh, I have fun doing that. That's late night weekend uh, fun stuff that, yeah. that I do. And 
Um, so cool. yeah, that's I do my all post. I'll do all my own post processing. Same here. So we're recording right now on Adobe Audition. Um, so oh. I'm self self taught oh, okay. on Adobe Audition after right. quite a few YouTube videos as well. But it's actually really nice software. A- anyways, uh, we digress. Uh-huh. Um, so okay, drones, cool. We've established cr- credibility as if there was any question uh, in in the beginning. Anyways, what? So let's jump right into it. Are there any misconceptions in the drone industry? I mean, is that possible? Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot. Uh, where do I begin? Uh, you know, I think this is sort of the w- number one topic in blogs, and in fact, in every piece, you know, I write or when I talk at a show, um, I I try to explain how I think a lot of the visionaries have overhyped the future capabilities of drones, and how everybody underestimates the incumbent technology like uh, manned aircraft and satellite. Uh, you know, uh, as you know, drones are not going to feed the world. They're not going to transform industries. They're not going to change the world. Penicillin changed the world. Um, you know, the moving assembly line changed industry. But drones are a great remote sensing tool, and albeit a very good one, um, because they do offer new capabilities that weren't available before because they're low altitude. But um, I think that's sort of where I see, you know, some of the misconception is that it's hyped. But but if I had to point to the number one misconception about the commercial drone industry, and it's related to the hype, is how fast it will grow and which sectors will do well and mm. which sectors were lagged. Um, as you know, I've I've written a lot about this. In fact, I wrote a post, and you may have read it, or your readers, your listeners may have read it. It's called "Diversity and Hype in the Commercial Drone Market Forecast." And and at this conference, I'm actually giving a presentation on that, and it's pretty much the same topic mm. because not a week goes by and I don't see a, a new industry forecast that hits my radar. I'm currently tracking 50, 50, 50? Independent, 50 independent agencies that make predictions about the size and growth of the commercial drone industry. And I, I shake my head because I've never seen this in an industry before. Um, and the thing about these is that each and every one, sort of in one way or another, they deliver these growth projections for drones that just are are nothing short of phenomenal. All the graphs go up, right? Nobody yeah. thinks about the the individual sectors. and um, But, uh, you know... I question, and I read all these reports. Um, so that, some of the reports, just to interject, like so, we're talking about like the Goldman Sachs report, oh, which yeah. has been heavily quoted. Yep. Uh, what was there? A, there was the Price Waterhouse Price Cooper's Waterhouse. one. Yep. Um, yep. It, all kinds of. I've contributed to one, and I'm almost like I was about to ask. So how do they come up with these estimates? But actually, I remember it was one about thermal imagers, and I'm not a thermal imaging expert, but uh-huh. I do know that this technology thermal imagers on drones has been relatively out of reach for a lot of people especially the average joe sure. consumer or commercial drone company or else you had to spend tens of thousands of dollars and then get a, a, a platform that just didn't really work right and so with the dji xt that's when i was predicting okay like you know there's going to be a rise in uh, in you know thermal aerial camera usage yeah and then they asked me, how, how, what's the market going to be worth? And I like literally couldn't answer. I was like, well, I don't know. Each one costs uh, $5,000. Yeah, right, uh, yeah. Let's extrapolate that uh, at a growth rate of maybe 5 to 10%. And I came up, you'll be happy to know, I came up with a very conservative estimate. Oh, good. Well, I like conservative <laughs> forecasts. Uh, um, you know, I think there's other things that people don't understand that these forecasts, they all cover different periods of time. And they're, they're covering different things. Like, for example, you may say one forecast that's just just sales. So it's just unit revenue sales versus a, a completely different forecast, which isn't even a forecast. It's called a total uh, market opportunity, right? And so um, so that would be a TAM. So uh, um, total addressable market. Uh, so you have these uh, factors that you do when you're creating a startup. And uh, startups know this, that there's TAM, SAM, and SOM. Uh, those are the, the market capabilities or the market uh, sizes, but that's not a forecast of what actual growth and um, uh, the size of the industry will be, mm. right? That's just addressable markets. Um, so every one, every one of these forecasts, you have to look at this, right? The PwC was a TAM, right? It was a total available market. So that's really not a forecast of what the drone industry will do. That's what, mm-hmm. what it absolutely positively could do in the best possible situation. And nobody's going to attain that. And the other thing about TAMs is, and sorry to digress here, Please. Um, TAMs are, are every time a new technology comes in, a TAM gets undercut. 
So drones actually undercut their own addressable market because as they get adopted, that market size shrinks, right? Hmm. Because you already have adoption. So hmm. um, these are the, these are the things that you learn. I, I was one of the things, of course, when I worked for these enterprise companies like SAP and Oracle and uh, um, and and PeopleSoft, I was a forecaster. I actually was a forecaster in manufacturing, and then I worked for forecast, and then I help create and design forecasting software. Mm. So I understand this, and this is sort of why it's the little bit, a little bit of the thing that I, I, um, I focus on, a little bit of my shtick is, is let's get our forecasts right. Um, people, are, people are misquoting that then in oh. some cases. They're like, oh, well, the drone market can be wor- is going to be worth you know, $120 billion by 2020. I think that's one of the... Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's actually just the potential market size Correct. at the very greatest. Yeah, and I be. think... I uh, This is a good point. You're, you're, you're right on. The, the problem comes when people make major financial decisions based on these forecasts. And my, forecast, my poster child for this is how in three to four years, almost everyone in the drone business wanted to pursue agriculture because the AUVSI came out with a forecast that said that agriculture was going to take up 90% of the market. Um, and, um, and they said 90%. That's what they said. Well, that is, they, they said 90%. I'm sorry. They said 90% of the market was going to be agriculture, the bulk of, and, and also first responders. Right. Oh, okay. But this was a 2013 forecast, right? Yeah, $82 that's... billion dollars worth of economic value that was going to be created. It's still quoted today. They still use it in the press releases. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, um, it's long, you know, it's long since been proven that that's incorrect. Um, but back then, I could see that it was wrong because I, we did research on the ag mar- uh, market, and we could see that there was it, the market itself was fraught with adoption issues, uh, and those addition issues exist today, and we don't think they're going away soon. Um, one of the gating factors for drone usage or even aerial imaging is the ability to use that image, and to use that image, you would need some variable rate technology. You'd need a variable rate sprayer. Well, mm. uh, let me give you an example of how that's not well adopted right now and how we've seen statistics that show it's actually going down. Um, in Iowa, and you can look back on, on, a, on a piece that I wrote um, back on this. I wrote a piece on Fillmore Farm, which is the biggest market. And in that, I go through two markets. I go through agriculture and, and film, photo, and video, compare those two markets. Um in Iowa, maybe 12 to 13 percent actual adoption or usage of variable rate technology. Um, so, if only hmm. 12 or 13 percent of the farmers in in Iowa actually use VRT, and we think the adoption rate is actually higher that they, they bought VRT um, and they and they have it, um, and they they use variable rate sprayers. They don't use them to to create prescription to to um, apply prescriptions to their field, mm. right? Because the 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 value chain of the information is the drone takes the picture, it assesses an area of the field, it finds an area of the field that needs to be looked at. You do some ground truthing. You you send your agronomist out there and and they go and look at it and see what the problem is. And okay, so let's say we have a pest problem. Okay, we need to apply pesticide. We don't apply pesticide to the whole field, just that one area of the field. So you'd need to go in with a variable rate sprayer Mm -hmm. and only spray that area. The thing that we found is we were looking at this market that the way people actually use sprayers isn't for prescriptions. What they use it for and the reason they adopted it is because it turns off at the end of the row. (laughs) <laughs> right because i don't want to spray where I, where there's no crops yeah. so they run down the row right and the variable rate sprayer automatically turns off they turn the tractor around they go back the other way turns back on now now it doesn't mean that drones don't provide great value for um looking at these images it absolutely does mm. right and and you can map small fields right because right now you can only map within a visual line of sight they do provide great value and they do allow you to uh see where there are potential problems but I think this is where it gets overhyped. Um, this is where um, people, you know, make statements that drones are transforming agriculture. Those are the headlines, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, that's that's my one example of of where um, we don't think that that's a leading market. We think it's sort of a lagging market. It doesn't mean that mm. farmers won't buy drones. We, yeah. we absolutely think they will, and and do more of it. And they are doing more of it because they're easier to use, and they've got software capabilities and like drone deploy it's a, it's a great piece of software that people are using because it's simple to use mm. and they can go do things that they've never done before which is begin that process of digital uh, farming 
Some of these, I'll just say one thing. So I was at the Beck Knowledge Days conference in in uh, Atlanta, Indiana, and Beck's Beck's uh, Superior Hybrids is a company that makes hybrid seeds, corn uh-huh. and soybeans, the two largest crops in the U.S. And or maybe, well, let's not count, let's not get rice into this, but uh, corn and soybeans, and they actually like whenever you go to this event, you as a farmer, you buy all your seed. They will give you if you buy enough seed, they'll give you a variable rate. Uh, machine, you know, right, an applier, applicator. applicator. And they'll also like just straight up give you a drone if you buy enough seed. Uh-huh. And so like so many farmers in Indiana and, and the surrounding areas are just like getting free drones now. And it's like pretty interesting because, you know, they'll just throw it up, up the field, you know, and say, okay, well, this is interesting. What can I do with this? And they'll get a little bit more and more interested. But it's like, it, it really resonated with me. It's like when you said that the main reason why they were using the variable rate applicators is because they turn off at the end of the row and then they can tur- circle back around and not waste that extra yeah. uh, you know, expense on the fertilizer or whatever they're applying to the crops. So they are very pragmatic. So if it's not working right away as well, they're not going to be using it. So that is also, I would say, an adoption uh, hurdle yeah. that needs to be overcome for yeah. this too. Yeah, for, for a large uptick, right? In, mm. And it doesn't mean that people aren't going to use it. You know, that's row crops, right? If you look to specialty crops and you look at high, high margin crops like grapes or avocados or nuts yeah. in, in California. Tree nuts um, and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, there's there, aerial imaging is a big deal. But here's where you start getting into competition with manned aircraft. Right. Mm. Because manned aircraft are covering large amounts of area and the incremental cost for them to sell you an image of your property is very, very low. Yeah. Um, But, you know, if I'm a small grape grower um, and I have uh, several vineyards and, you know, I have single vineyards. Right. Um, um, I can I can use a drone to do that and assess the health or the irrigation or there's lots of great uh, uses. Yeah. Uh, And and so I do. I I, your points well taken. It's sort of that this op uptick is going to be a little slower than what people had originally envisioned and what the visionaries were selling as this. Um, and I think a lot of companies figured this out, that that ag wasn't going to be as fast a growing market as originally thought. And um, now they see, the, you know, like, for example, the Golden Saxon report that, that you mentioned, right? Um, everybody's pivoting to construction. Oh, construction is going to be huge. Let's focus on that. Everybody <laughs> yeah. scurries off in that direction. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I, I say, well, what's going to happen when they find out there's issues there, too? Because um, we did a series of reports, and um, I'd invite your listeners to go look at it. It's on my website under the, under the research heading. And there's, there's four free reports. It's called The Truth About Drones In... And name the industry, construction, infrastructure ins- inspection, precision agriculture, mapping and surveying, uh, first responders and emergency. You can mm-hmm. see those four free reports, which you can go in and look at. And I go into depth about um, what are the opportunities and challenges in each of those industries for drones. Mm. Nice. What's a day in the life of the uh, Snow household? Are you and Charlotte kind of bouncing ideas off each other, chatting about drones all day, yeah, or is no, it like a nice mix? No, it's <laughs> you know, there's none of that. Um, Charlotte has her own full time job, and you know, it's for for me, it's nights and weekends, and and uh, you know, daytime, it's um, fielding a lot of calls and writing proposals and okay. um, uh, doing doing research, and you know, I try to read all the 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 research or the news that comes out. Um, no, there's so, so much. That it, there's so out. much news, right? I spend an hour and I honestly, I spend an hour and a half a day just looking at the news that have come out. So I have various news feeds that um, tell me what's going on and what what new products are Trying out there. Trying to find or, or, what's actually worth reading. There's so much you could spend, yeah, hours. Oh, and you hours can. All and day. That is the issue, right? It's it's culling through that and trying to find out what's important. And when I do, I tweet it out, right? Mm. So um, I think I'm up to maybe twenty two and a half thousand followers by the time this airs you'll probably be more well you know <laughs> i i, I hope it I, I think it's a service um and my feel like you know i owe a service to the community um because you know when i need information people are forthcoming and i appreciate that so back to the community what i want to do is um let you know about the relevant news and then comment on the relevant news and there's several of us that conversation converse back and forth mm-hmm. um so you can you can do see that you can follow me on Twitter and and one of the way to keep up with the news at least with that and then I have a Facebook page that I yeah, that I update with significant news at least once once a month uh, once a week, nice um, and then I do blog posts that are um, you know once a um, once every two weeks, um, 
So I try to keep people up with what I think are the relevant trends in the industry. But again, that comes from a lot of work. So daily work is really uh, calling through the news, figuring out what's mm. important, figuring out what where the you know weeding out the the noise from the signal, um, and then uh, uh, writing is probably at least four or five hours a day. And then there's editing back and forth between uh, Charlotte and I. You know, Busy. she takes she takes what I do and you know says, hey, it's better said this way and. Uh, you know, then I have to go back and rewrite and, and, um, uh, that's kind of a, a typical day. Nice. Nice team action going there. Cool. So, okay. There are misconceptions in the drone industry. Now that we've actually settled that point, what kind of speed, let's talk about some of the drone companies that are out there. Um, what are some companies that exist that you feel have a big opportunity? And maybe I'll add something on this. Um, if you want to go into maybe it's companies that don't exist yet, if there's addressable opportunities uh, that they yeah. could be focusing on and targeting. Yeah. Um, well, well, you know, it's, it, it's, as you're kind of getting a flavor here, the, the industry is very fast moving, um, both in technology and opportunity. And, and, and if you blink, you're behind. And, and there's this great quote from, from uh, Andy Grove, uh, who was the founder of Intel. And he says, the lesson is we all need to expose ourselves to the wind of change. And so keeping up with change is, you know, a big deal. So right now, let me tell you that what I think the biggest opportunities lie in the industry are industry-specific enterprise solutions. Um, I think people are focused on solutions that are generic um, and are missing the fact that that in specific industries, big brands hold the mind share of companies. So, for example, like in surveying and mapping, um, you know, you hear the word Topcon or you hear the, the you hear Trimble. People know what mm. you're talking about, right? Because they're in the mapping and surveying business. Uh, so those and and those two companies have uh, drone solutions. So and they have uh, solutions that may not be terrifically focused on the specific industry, but they do have enterprise solutions because they've hooked it with software mm -hmm. and they've hooked it with services, right? So it's those industry-specific enterprise services. I think the other biggest opportunity lies in data services. Um, so, um, you know, companies like Autodesk and Drone Deploy and Precision Hawk, I, I think those are companies that are well-positioned for doing well. And, and going back to enterprise solutions, I think companies like Skycatch and Kespri, they understand their target vertical right mm -hmm. they're focused on construction or mining and aggregates or or uh, or oil and gas and it's those turnkey enterprise solutions enterprises want solutions they're not they yeah. don't want to be they don't want to be hacking and putting together uh drones or cameras or anything or exactly. they don't want a guy got to go find the software or anything they're looking for a complete solution and then i think integrated business service offerings so where people are offering um a business service to a particular vertical. So companies like Sky Futures and Redbird, that's, that's an airware company, mm -hmm. uh, DroneView Technologies, they offer integrated business service solutions. I think they're going to do well. Mm. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So I guess a lesson to those maybe, I, I'm sure we have some would-be entrepreneurs that are listening to this. And so if you were to suggest maybe something like, hey, I'm thinking about starting a drone company. First of all, you better know the industry that you're heading into. I yeah. think you should very, very know it very extremely well yeah. in order to integrate drones into the workflow. But would you suggest then going after a specific industry vertical, whether you're doing services or data stuff or what have you? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think you're right. So the first point is y you need to know the vertical that you're going to address and you need to know all the pieces of it outside of drones. Forget about just just drones for a minute. Let's talk about, you know, uh, let's say mapping and surveying. Mm -hmm. um, do you know who ASPRS is? If you want to do surveying and mapping, mm. um, right? That's that's a certifying agency. That's the uh, um, something you can look up on the web. ASPRS. Um, they certify you in uh, the ability to do um, things like photogrammetry and, and and lidar, and you know they have lessons and capabilities. And that's a yeah. group of people where the the GIS specialists uh, know uh, what the requirements are because they've been servicing that industry, uh, people who want surveys and maps for a long time. Uh, so, you know, my recommendation is is that you know your vertical first. Um, the drone part's not the hard part. The hard part is really knowing your industry and, and totally. knowing where the need is. Um, so, you know, that's sort of one thing that I recommend to it. And I wrote a piece a while ago um, 
I think it's five things you should know. Uh, you, you can find it under blog, under on my website, mm -hmm. uh, five things that uh, you, you should know um, if you want to do commercial drone services. And oh, nice. one of the very first things I put, we talked about this earlier, is video. Um, everyone assumes that, you know, a lot of startups think it's either two guys in a drone or one guy in two drones business, right? They, they've started up and they think drones are cool and I'm going to build a business around this. And it, and you can, um, but you better be able to do some of the things that clients want well, like editing and shooting and framing and, and trucking. You got to know, you know what truck and dolly is? Um, do you know, uh, you know, what a, no what, a what, pan, what a pan is, <laughs> right? And these are all things. I know what that, that is. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the, these are the types of things it's in, it's in that post. So, you know, I just invite your readers to go take a look at that. Um, because cool. then I go down through the other things like, um, you know, if you want to go all the way to LIDAR, <clears throat> um, if you want to do lidar, that's a complex business, right? You just don't mm. throw a drone up and take a take it take the card out of the drone out of the drone when you're done and and uh, throw it into a piece of software. It's a huge workflow um, and massive files. And uh, mm. you know these are specialists. These are people who've been doing lidar for a long time. So, you know that's what I recommend to to entrepreneurs. Now on the other side, there's a hardware opportunities. I think there's tremendous hardware opportunities for um, companies. Um, there, the fact that there's a company here um, today on the show floor called Aerotena. Um, they make um, r small radar-based um, sensors. And one of the things that I wrote about this recently about um, drone sense and avoid is a, is a difficult thing. Um, it, you know, it's no slam dunk. It's, it's not something, and it's something that companies are developing more and more on. You see Intel and you see um, uh, Unique and, and, and DJI beginning to, to tackle the object avoidance part of mm. it but sense and avoid where i'm actually going out and and i'm uh, doing collision um avoidance with approaching aircraft that's a more complex issue and it may require some hardware that that isn't developed or is developed yet and aerotena is one of those companies that has several pieces of hardware and they're out there testing it and they've been out testing it for a long time and they have they have manufacturers in china that make a lot of these components um that's where I think that, mm. that we'll see more capabilities on either the prosumer or higher drones, uh, where it's important where you're flying beyond the visual line of sight. And I need to know uh, what's coming at me and mm -hmm. who's, who's going to be in my airspace. Um, so to, and, just to clarify, though, you're, say, you're not saying like, okay, go out and start building a, a drone drone, like a flying platform. It's more like there's a lot of unaddressed hardware market for like, just accessories. I don't know what else to call them. Like a, a, a dish, in addition to drone or yeah. like hardware components. To hardware maybe. components, right? Okay. And, and and if you look at Intel's website, you look at you look at the, their recent acquisitions Movidius. with Movidius and some of the mm. other, um, uh, you know, Aztec and the capabilities they're already putting into right the the real sense um, technology that they put into the unique drones and any they even have their own platform. Um, the uh, those capabilities, right, for onboard processing um, and object recognition. Um, I, I just think there's a host of, of places where uh, innovators can do embedded software, so embedded software, mm. um, capability, machine learning, uh, deep vision. That's called deep vision, quote, you know. You know yeah. Quotes, it's, you know, it's the buzzword. <laughs> um, but, but it's, you know. It's it's it is complex. It it is technical, and I think there's opportunities there for for entrepreneurs that are specialized. Cool, nice. So, what what is there a part of the industry, the drone industry right now, commercial drone industry, that is somewhat ignored right now? Maybe like that you feel needs a little bit more attention paid to it. Um, yeah, I think there's two things actually. I think it's the incumbents and standards, and and by incumbents I mean both the incumbent technology like manned aircraft and satellites that and and the existing service office, uh, offerings from the big brands that really already service a specific industry as I talked about earlier. Um, and and these are where competitors for drones and drone based services uh, uh, businesses. I think people ignore that, right? So. Um, Again, that's in that four-part series, uh, The Truth About Drones in X. Um, you'll see that there's a whole section, each one of those. I cover the incumbents and incumbent technology. Um, um, in standards, um, I think there's a the whole lot that can can be done or is still open and, and not addressed yet. And Chris Carotti, he just wrote a piece on this called uh, Why Standards Will Be Critical to UAV Adoption. And it's actually on the Commercial UAV News website 
Um, it's a great analysis of of this. In, in a nutshell, he kind of outlines uh, where we are as an industry on the issues of safety and security and privacy and data protection and industry standards. And he, he makes a very good point that without those standards, we're really never going to get to widespread adoption of commercial drones because enterprises are going to struggle with this. Um, and there's a great quote in this piece. Um, uh, it says that uh, companies who don't think there will be standards are dead. <laughs> and and I agree with that. And I think these I think drone manufact some of the drone manufacturers, some of the big brands need to wake up and hear that message. Mm, nice, yeah. The, the, there's all kinds of stuff. I mean, coming from like corporate aviation and and everything. I mean, there's like just huge safety standards and logging and SMS sis- programs, which is safety management systems, not text messaging. Right. And all these things that are coming and will come because the enterprise requires them. And who's who is the enterprise going to ask first about integrating drones and the legal aspects of it is probably their aviation departments. Yeah. And yeah. We're talking like the big companies yeah. here with the the private aircraft. So. Totally agree on yeah, that and too. I think you're, the point that you made is is that is sort of this ignored. This is the other ignored piece of it, and uh, is that 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 drones are aviation. Mm. I think that's a huge, huge thing that's sort of ignored, right? Because it, it, a lot of it grew up out of the hobby industry, and I, I saw this early on. I wrote this early on in a piece, um, um, I think called uh, the democratization of of, of uh, aerial photography, and. Um, and then another piece that followed on and was comparing uh, uh, the commercial drone industry, whether it was going to be the military-based um, companies that were going to thrive in the in the in the commercial market, or whether it was going to grow up out of the the hobby industry. And I was clearly seeing that the trend was it was going to grow up out of the hobby industry because of all the restrictions and capabilities that the 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 large defense contractors um, uh, were under um, because they. Um, they are vendors to the government, right? Prevents them from from really focusing on on um, selling the same aircraft that they have t- at a lower price point. And I could see that the industry was going to go down in price really quick from those aircraft because those aircraft, um, you know, like the Reaper and um, mm-hmm. you know several of the others that were flying out that they're in the you know Scan Eagle. Uh, these these are these are drones with huge infrastructures, and I didn't see them in the commercial market. Uh, making an impact for a very, very long time because of those, because of the high costs mm. and the complexity. And they were early on, right? If you remember, um, the early on, they were some of the ones that people were using, um, like the BP oil pipeline in, in Alaska. You know, they're using Scan, Scan Eagle. Eagle and and these things. These are huge infrastructures yeah. and high costs. And, and you can do more with a lower cost. You can do the same thing with a lower cost uh, uh, drone with with a, a, a yeah. um, capability because everything's shrinking. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, you know, um, it's Moore's law um, applied to the drone industry. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, it's sort of that ignored piece of it though, but they understood that it was aviation. The drone industry that grew up out of the hobby aircraft didn't and are just now figuring this out and you'll see they're hiring legal people, and, mm. you know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you, uh, you were right on that. It's, it's, it's I that could, ignored pieces aviation. I could go on a rant about that. I yeah. think it was Chris Anderson who was like tweeting about how drones are not aviation and I was uh, very miffed Woo. about that. Yeah, no. <laughs> as soon as you're a, cent- a millimeter above the ground and yep. outside, you're in the federal, you're in the national uh, Air airspace, airspace system, mm-hmm. so. Right. Um, don't agree with that, uh, but yeah, it's it's aviation, and you get a pilot certificate for being uh, 107 certified. So right. you literally are called a unmanned uh, aircraft uh, right. system, and you are the pilot in control, pilot. the PIC, right? Yeah. And and that's the way the NTSB looks at it, and uh, um, you know that's the way the DOT and, and the FAA look at it. It's a um, it's a pilot based mm. certification, right? And it and it even it's even true. In, in commercial aviation standard, you know, when you jump on an aircraft, right, the it's it's the pilot. He's he's in yeah, charge, right? Totally. He's the guy. He's the guy. You see the pilot get out and he puts his little safety vest on and he goes and he does a walk around, mm-hmm. right, on the plane. <laughs> he's responsible for the for the final check on Ultimate the aircraft ultimately for it for it takes off. Nice, cool. Well, so we've talked a little bit about software and hardware. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll kind of um, skip along here. I want to know. So, what do you think after talking about all this stuff? What's kind of the most exciting thing that's happening to you in the drone industry today? Uh, well, uh, there's lots of things exciting happening to me. I, th- I think the, one of the things that I'm most excited about 
is that we now have FAA Part 107. We've got regulations in place, and and they weren't as onerous as people thought, or they could have been. So we have the basis for an industry, and we have a base to grow on. I think that's exciting. And you know, a few weeks ago, um, Patrick Egan of SUAS News he wrote a piece called uh, Part 107: Your Golden Ticket. And it, and it really summed up my feelings about uh, where we are. There, there's there been a lot of grousing about, you know, what's not in the new rule. Geez, we can't fly over 400 feet. We can't fly at night. I can't fly beyond visual line of sight. I can't get my DVD box set delivered to me where my candy bars <laughs> delivered to me. You know, um, uh, yada, yada. It it, it it goes on. And I get that. They, you know, the people that are all right. But my feeling is there's plenty of work that can be done right now under this rule. So the 10 years of uncertainty that we've had, because that's when the first aviation rulemaking committee was formed 10 years ago, um, it, that uncertainty is over and people can begin to offer services. So from the real estate agent who wants to wants aerial photos uh, to the cellular company that wants tower inspection to the insurance company that wants to get proper damage assessments to the first responder who wants a better view of an incident. I mean, I, I think that's exciting. And, and, and what's also exciting to me because I'm in business is, is that there's competition. Right, mm. and competition helps everybody. It's yeah. it's it's you know everyone. Some people think it's a race to the bottom, and and certainly there's a lower barrier to entry, and and we'll see new entrants. And you know, for general photography, I think you know prices go down a, as a result, and people then have to differentiate yourself. But um, there's a healthy part of this that competition. It means that there's better customer benefits because everybody's working harder to produce a better product. I I personally I find that exciting. Cool. I agree with you on that. And where do you see us then as an industry, as a a commercial drone industry in like two, five and 10 years, as if it's even possible to really speculate? I'm going to set a reminder 10 years from now after you answer this. Okay, well, let me look into my crystal ball. It's murky at first, right? (laughs) Um, uh, It's coming clear. You know, in in two years, uh, honestly, and you may not like this, and but I, I don't. I see us mostly in the same place that we are today. So that's two years out. Um, we'll have better hardware. We'll have better software. I think we'll see significant advancement in regular. Uh, but I don't think we're going to see significant advancements in regulation. Mm. They're going to see enterprise adoption. They're going to begin to to work on standards and standard operating procedures and 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 those things. And I tell people, you know, welcome to the plateau. Right now we're on a plateau and get used to this because it took us 10 years to get to where we are uh, now with current rule. Mm-hmm. Um, question mark, you know, how, how, how long will it be for the next major rule? Um, how long will that take? I, I saw news uh, uh, today um, about the NASA UTM conference, which is uh, later this week in New York. Um, PK, who's sort of the head of the, the NASA UTM project, he said, you know, this, we, we're going to make recognitions probably by 2019. Okay, that's when they'll make recommendations, right? Mm. That doesn't mean we're going to see an automated, integrated system. Who, who's going to who's who's going to pay for it? Is the FAA yeah. going to pay for it? They're not budgeted to pay for it. <laughs> um, you know, is one of the big companies going to pick up the slack? And you know, well, then how are they going to make revenue? These are all the sort of the business issues, right? The technical issues, I think, are going to get solved. The business issues, right? The economics of it is where I think it'll it'll struggle. And and. You know, I think the FAA is taking a great um, um, approach to it. They're they're not uh, they're they're looking at more of a performance based standard than prescribing a piece of hardware uh, or a system to make it work. I think that's the right approach, and they're working mm. with industry. And kudos to them. Um, I think Marco Huerta's. You know, again, I'll I'll give throw some kudos. I think he's he's smart and he's right on. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to see us uh, do what they did with ADSB, which is mandate a piece of hardware. Mm. Um. And and do it inappropriately, um, because then you now have a problem um, with adoption, right? And, and they gave a long horizon. It isn't even until 2020 that people or general aviation is required to have an ADSB mm. transponder. And even then, it's only ADSB out. It's not in. So I, I can tell people where I am, but unless I have an in capability, I don't know who else is there. Yeah. Uh, so you know, these are the small things that that you know the nit and the detail that really matter. Mm. Um, so uh, um, you know, beyond that, it's hard to really see where we're going to be in in you know in in five years or or ten years. Um, we don't we're make conservative forecasts. We don't we it's yeah. very conservative. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, there's sort of this the the sage advice of of Yogi Berra. You know, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Yeah, 
right? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, that's true. So last question then for you, Colin. What's what's one piece of advice that you'd give to newbies entering the drone, the commercial drone industry? Yeah, yeah well, we talked about this a little earlier. Um, you know, specialize, uh, you know, find a niche, get training, get certified. And and um, I don't just mean get the remote pilot certification mm-hmm. from the FAA. I mean, assess which market or markets or use cases you think are going to provide you the best chance of success and then get the skills you need. Um, again, it, it's the piece that I wrote, uh, five skills you need to succeed in the, in the commercial drone market. Um, so, you know, I'd just um, recommend, you know, listeners, if, if that's where, that's who you are, if you're really starting, you want to know where to start out in this thing and, um, uh, go to my website, to, uh, look in the blogs. It's, it's, it's an older piece. So you may have to uh, scroll through, uh, a few of the blogs, but you get there and it's called mm. five skills you need to succeed in the commercial drone market. Wow. Thank you so much, Colin. That was, uh, that was awesome. I'm so happy to have had you on the show. Um, I, there's a ton of, val- I'm going to have to give this a couple listens and let it all sink in. I think we got a ton of great insight. We debunked some myths. We talked about the 50 different, <laughs> 50 or 60 different industry forecast reports that are just being quoted all over the place. Um, I've, what I've done is I've picked the lowest the lowest uh, projection one, and smart. that's the one that that's I kind of stick with. Smart yeah. move. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, 120 right, billion. Yeah. Uh, well, it can only go crazy. up from there if you're conservative. Yeah, cool. So, man, thank you so much for being here, Colin. Um, you can go ahead and, uh, as, as we talked about, you can check out um, the Drone Analyst website at droneanalyst.com, and you can follow Colin on Twitter at Drone Analyst. And while you're at it, you can go ahead and follow the podcast at Drones Podcast on Twitter or Facebook.com slash Drones Podcast. Um, subscribe on iTunes or what have you. We're on iHeartRadio now, if anyone uses that. I don't even know. Uh, but all over the place, uh, doing really well. But what we're missing is your comments. And so I do receive a lot of private messages. But the conversation does, hasn't really started uh, too publicly yet on, on social media. So we'd love to loop Colin in on, on, on Drone Analyst and see what you guys have uh, questions for or comments. And thank you so much for listening. Once again, thank you for being here, Colin. Thanks, Ian. appreciate this. My pleasure. Pleasure was all ours um, and all the listeners, too. So um, we'll catch you on the flip side, everyone. We're cutting off the mics. Cheers. Cheers.